technology is magical. Uh, anything you can imagine can be realized by science and technology. And um, you see this all the time. Um, in 1865, Jules Verne, in his novel From Earth to the Moon, uh, talked about reaching the moon. Uh, and he was wrong by just about 100 odd years. Uh, in 69, May 1969, Neil Armstrong touched down on the moon. Um, this is the kind of realization that invariably happens when technology catches up with imagination of man. Um, the other aspect of uh, human beings uh, is unfortunately the urge to violence. And war is ultimate manifestation of that urge to violence. We see this happening in Ukraine. Yes, we see this um, in our society. Uh, we see this everywhere. And now uh, the uh, interface between technology and war or conflict and this urge to violence is really um, that war showcases technology and technolo in technological developments. And th that's the sad fact, unfortunately, uh, because the cutting edge technologies invariably are first manifested in instruments of war. Uh, in instruments and tools of annihilation, destruction. Um, but consider where the technology is getting us in terms of um, what war will be like in the future. It's not going to be like what you see in Ukraine. That's the kind of uh, a leftover from um, the Second World War type of uh, destruction and uh, direct um, you know, annihilation. What we are getting into in terms of, say, nanotechnologies, in terms of um, um, artificial intelligence and so on, is that more and more human beings are going to be distanced from the actual war of machines. Curiously, in, in 1897, H.G. Wells, in his novel, some of you perhaps have read it, called The War of the Worlds, uh, first, any such uh, a heat ray, as he called it, and that heat ray in in present day circumstances is laser. So uh, he, he talked about Martian invasion and so on. Except that we are now using the lasers uh, against other human beings. Um, so this is the uh, aspect that I think H. E. Wells did not expect. But what he did in 1904, for instance, is to conceive of armored vehicles that he called the ironclads, uh, which was the forerunner to tanks. Um, and just in 1904, he uh, emphasized this. Uh, by 1917, the first tanks were employed in war at the Battle of Cambrai. Uh, and, and so the, you see the time compressing between how you imagine something and how it gets realized in terms of an actual machine that does your bidding, uh, that does what, you're, what you've designed it to do. Um, so now, while we are still in the industrial age military-wise, in terms of tanks, aircraft, and manned platforms, uh, where, the, um, where the trend is getting you is into a space where robotics, remotely um, controlled armament systems, are getting to be in the mainstream. Um, so what you have, for instance, are now these are not just at the design stage. These are actually being tested in prototypes uh, by the more advanced countries uh, with higher technology performances and accomplishments. Um, uh, you have, for instance, uh, something called, um, the, you know, you have right now in Aberdeen in the United States Army is actually testing uh, robotic systems that go along with actual troops. Uh, in war, in exercises, war exercises, uh, wherein they sense mines that uh, the troops should not step on. Uh, these are used as scouts for re reconnaissance. Uh, you know, you go out there, you send out these systems, and they reconnoiter the territory. They look out for uh, the enemy adversary systems that are targeting you, that's, that are surveilling the battlefield, etc. Now, what is being done right now by, by the more advanced militaries is to see what the interface is going to be like between human beings and these war-making machines. Um, so um, this is where the stage is at uh, for uh, the advanced militaries of the world, which include uh, America, of course, uh, and China. 
which really is amongst the more leading nations in terms of applying um, you know, advanced technology to the battlefield and in terms of designing weapon systems and so on. Um, the, the real thing that we're getting into is how is technology translated into a weapon or after you have imagined a weapon? It's basically to invest monies. So if you are a country that has a lot of resources, that, uh, that is rich, you're able to afford this kind of translation easier than other countries that are, shall we say, less well endowed. Uh, a country like India, for instance, uh, which has the capacity, um, but may not have the resources to invest to realize those kinds of uh, technological thresholds, uh, which will get you the kind of armaments that the richer countries uh, are able to lay their hands on. Um, now, the, the thing about war is that once you get into this realm where machines do the actual fighting, and this is where we are getting to, as I've said, and many of the, um, uh, the uh, countries like NATO countries, like, you know, the, like Great Britain, for instance, have already set up what they think will be the backbone for uh, command and control of these autonomously worked systems that are run by artificial intelligence and that thrive on uh, the kind of uh, ruggedness and reliability that, say, nanotechnologies uh, promise armaments uh, that are uh, that can create all kinds of hyper reactive, uh, you know, explosions, uh, explosives that can be translated into hyper reactive. Uh, explosives, for instance, that can, at, at, at the first instance of a provocation or of the machine sensing uh, that something is targeting it or you are being targeted, will get on into a, a, an, a, an active mode and explode or, you know, fire off the weapon that it is uh, actually controlling. So that's artificial intelligence for you. Now, the, the thing is that, uh, uh, say, Great Britain, Great Britain, I was telling about uh, the Great Britain, is the first country that has actually designed a command and control system for such weapons. It's in a prototype stage, and it doesn't take long to translate a prototype into an actual uh, setup. Uh, it's called MAPLE. The acronym is MAPLE, a Marine Autonomous Platform Exploitation. And now, uh, these are things where these are, you know, envelop all machines in all domains, war fighting machines in all domains, in the air, on the ground, underwater. And these are all domains. So the machines will be really doing the electromagnetic spectrum fighting, for instance, electronic jamming, radar jamming, etc., radar suppression, and so on, for uh, autonomously driven helicopters and to come in, and these are already being tested. Um, uh, so you have these weapons platforms wherein the human being is rendered by and large redundant, very, very, very gradually. It's for us to decide how much we get, want to get into the loop as far as uh, the autonomous, autonomously um, uh, designed weapon systems, uh, autonomously acting weapon systems uh, can uh, you know, uh, uh, behave on their own. It's up to us to decide, of course. But the question is here, it's a race between the artificial intelligence and how quickly it becomes far superior to the human brain uh, in, in a battlefield. Now, this is the kind of uh, thing that you're going to get into very soon. Because, as you well know, you have perhaps heard of the Big Blue, for instance, the IBM computing machine that has regularly defeated grandmasters at chess. So it can outthink the human brain. Now, if you have designed a machine that can outthink you, uh, perhaps we may end up having a problem uh, of the kind that H.G. Wells, not in the Martian invasion sense, thought of, of uh, wars between machines. Now, the problem is this. If the machines are going to do all the fighting, then doesn't the human being that is supposed to control these machines, um, is, aren't these machines liable to get out of hand? That was some of the uh, thinking like, uh, you know, many of the novelists in the, the last century actually uh, talked about, uh, you know, something called the dragon seed, for instance, uh, a situation wherein you had 
autonomously uh, you know run strategic forces deciding when it is that they feel endangered enough to let go and start a war now this is the kind of stuff that is really in the here and now it's a capability that countries now have uh, the uh, the curious thing though is many of the more advanced countries like uh, the United States, for instance, the generals there are getting very uncomfortable, for uh, example, with having special forces in a helicopter, being uh, the helicopter being run by autonomously driven and flown by artificial intelligence. There's no pilot in the cockpit. So it is the discomfort of the special forces, for instance, who want to get in and be, and be flown to the uh, battle site. Uh, these are problems that have not been resolved by, um, by anybody yet because there's this discomfort level at letting uh, technology into what should be the decision-making matrix uh, that human beings should be part of or should control and command and control. Now, um, that's the, the trend wherein the machines do the thinking for you. It raises the kind of uh, moral problems about uh, going to war, for instance. If how much control would you have in this kind of a situation of autonomous weapon systems that can think, that can do just about everything by way of surveilling the uh, scene, uh, of, of assessing the risk, of uh, judging what the best um, uh, action should be in any particular circumstance. Uh, they are far, the machines are far better endowed because there is data fusion, which they then are able to uh, do. Uh, data coming in from all kinds of sensors, space-based, land-based, sea-based, and so on, that, are, uh, that can then feed into any particular war-fighting machine. And it's in all domains. So all domain data is getting fused in and getting simplified for the war-fighting machine to then decide what to do in any given situation. Uh, the, uh, the world, therefore, is on the cusp of um, warfare that's going to be machine-driven, that's going to be artificial intelligence-driven, uh, wherein man may lose control. Even though he has devised these technologies, he may uh, find and discover that he has become redundant uh, to the machines uh, who have taken over the job of thinking and deciding when to go to war, how to go to war, how to fight the war, and with what results. Because these are calibrated. You can decide what outcomes you want in your algorithms that you feed into that are going to uh, drive the machines, which will then take over. You can then, as, as in the IBM Blue, that decides the moves, uh, depending on what the human grandmaster uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is doing, you are going to have these machines then outthinking each other. It may not; they may not need humans in the loop. This is, in many ways, a very frightening prospect. Uh, but also, because there are no humans involved, you know, uh, human beings might think, "Well, let's let the machines do the fighting in, say, a space where there there are no human beings, where there are no human losses." <laughs> well, is that possible? It is possible, anything is possible, because when war gets, gets that machine real, when machines begin to take over war fighting, to what end then? What other countries then, will they, what will they be fighting for? What kind of supremacy will they want to strive for in that kind of a situation? These are uh, the sorts of um, issues that we'll have to confront in the future. Uh, many... Uh, Analysts and thinkers are thinking about, well, we need to now legislate the kind of rules and regulation and laws that govern machine warfare uh, to, to bring in some kind of, uh, of uh, some kind of a fix, a human fix to the kind of uh, machine, um, overwhelmingly machine driven uh, milieu that we are going to get into. But again, is that possible? You can, all you need is a rogue state. For you to uh, for it to decide well no uh, my uh, war fighting machines will uh, not be bound by any law uh, and then you're go you're getting back to the same old thing wherein uh, you have uh, an awful lot of uh, destructive capability uh, which ostensibly uh, are is under the control of some madman assuming there is such a person who is uh, has is able to control his machines 
And, and let me tell you, even in terms of the kind of destructive capability, we know now the means and the wherewithal of destruction of the kind that you're talking about, as I've just very uh, barely sketched. Um, but you have now the use of nanotechnologies and those kinds of things, uh, which uh, can result in mini nukes, very mini nukes uh, that are that weigh say five pounds, but are able uh, with with five pounds that which means that about two or three kilograms of fissile material with uh, kiloton uh, 100 kiloton yield, which makes nuclear and thermonuclear weapons extremely usable. So you, on the one hand, you have these war fighting machines in the conventional sense, you know, flying platforms, combat aircraft, unmanned, unmanned armored vehicles, unmanned uh, submarines, uh, of, of, you know, warships, etc., which are already, uh, by the way, now scouring the sea. You know, they're going around all over the place in the seas. They can be found there. They're being tested in these domains. Uh, but then you also have these thermonuclear weapons uh, that are very usable because they are so small. They, uh, they have very little, if they're thermonuclear two-stage, it means there's very little radioactivity uh, if, they, uh, uh, if they explode over uh, uh, a location, a target site. It'll, they'll merely kill off people, uh, but do no other harm uh, in terms of radioactivity, which makes them, uh, shall we say, uh, something of a, uh, makes these weapons something of a pariahs uh, in, in the world since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So many of these constraints will be lost in the future when machines are there and when these technologies make such weapons uh, of massive destructive capabilities possible. I think human beings are entering a very interesting stage of development of their own minds and their own morality because more and more we'll have to look inward to see uh, what we want the technologies that we have developed, that we have realized, uh, what we want them, these technologies to do what outcomes we want in terms of wars. Maybe it's uh, better sense prevails all round and everybody decides to outlaw war. But that this is something that goes against the urges of violence, the urge to violence that human beings are, that's built, that we are hardwired with. And that is a problem that we will have to contend with in the future, uh, all of us. Uh, thank you very much.